Hi, everybody. You know me, I'm Gavin, and really psyched to have this talk with y'all and with my good friend, Bill Beninati, who's a legend and an amazing person and has a long history of medicine in the Air Force and otherwise. But if you've, uh, if you've done a search and rescue in Utah, he's probably been a part of it. He runs all the, the, he's big time in telehealth and the ICU and runs a lot of the HeliVac services across the state of Utah. And it's just an awesome guy. And he's also been our safety director for the first two X Red Rocks and hopefully will be for ever more. He's fantastic. And he and I get to run around during the race and chase you all and supply assistance when needed. So far, we haven't had to do that too much. So it's mostly just been fun running around and watching you guys roll and having a good time. So you probably saw this one and thought sleep. How can that be that important? And I learned after the 2015 race that I really struggled with sleep and learned afterwards after going through a lot of hormone testing and, and uh, worked with a, an Olympic trainer for a while down in Pocatello and went to a sleep therapist, actually not went to, but a sleep therapist actually reached out to me, saw some of the XOP stuff and thought it'd be really fun for his show, which is based on sleep. He has a podcast just based on sleep. And I learned a lot from him. I, I kind of taught him what the race is all about and the requirements, the physical requirements, and then how much sleep you can possibly get at night. Obviously, you know, when you're going five o'clock in the morning till 1030 at night and dinner and all those things, you don't have a lot of time for sleep. And so he taught me a lot about how to prepare, which takes a lot of time before, way before the race to get ready for that kind of thing. And he talked about concepts like banking sleep and sleep hygiene. And it was, it was all just fascinating when to use caffeine, when to not, when to make decisions, when to not make decisions in terms of the time of the day. And all of this is really relevant for even a shorter race like the X Red Rocks and not just to do well, but also to not get hurt. So when I, when we started kind of going through the list of all the shows that we wanted to produce before the race, sleep was one of the big ones. And it occurred to me that we have a professional in our ranks who knows a lot more about it than I do. And so, and that's Bill Beninati and he lives down at the point and many of you I'm sure know him, but Bill, take it from there. I, I thank you for your time. We all thank you for your time and appreciate this great knowledge. Gavin, thanks. It's a privilege to be uh, talking to this uh, group. And is my screen showing up okay? That works. looks great. Okay, good. Um, excellent. So let me um, start my screen show. And um, the first thing I want to say is there is a tendency for sleep experts to get a little bit preachy sometimes um, and try to scare people with all the bad things that can go wrong if you don't sleep perfectly. And I definitely do not want to do that, right? What I would like you to do is to have an understanding, a working understanding of what goes into good sleep and look at how to optimize those things in your life without you know, trying to create chaos, right? We all have to live our lives. And certainly as a ICU doctor, my life has been anything but a textbook picture of, you know, perfect sleep and somehow it all seems to work. Um, so to get it out of the way, let's talk about the heavy negative upfront about sleep deprivation, right? It is certainly the cause of countless um, very bad incidents and disasters around the world, both small and large, individual accidents, as well as major industrial, uh, industrial disasters. So it is important that we take it seriously. Um, there is a a factor of acute sleep loss, right? Somebody who's caught up on their sleep and then has a very short night or misses a night of sleep. And there are some nice studies, which you're probably familiar with, that compare acute sleep loss to being intoxicated by alcohol in terms of your neuropsych performance. And I think all of us understand that. And I think 
all of us can feel when we're suffering acute sleep loss. A much more serious problem, I guess I would say, is what we would call chronic partial sleep loss. That's when you're a little bit short night after night after night after night. And um, I threw these pictures up because it's an example from my personal life of some chronic partial sleep loss. And I understand this very well, but the sky crack really bit me one day. I was just starting out and the thermal index was negative 12. You know, my mentor was saying like, it's weird weather, you should not be flying. And I flew into a 2,700 foot per minute sharp edge thermal, ended up upside down bilateral cravats. And all of that and my reactions came back to my, my judgment was seriously impaired by chronic partial sleep loss. It's insidious. And the biggest thing is if you ask somebody who's acutely sleep deprived how they're doing and then test them, there is generally a good matchup. If you look at somebody who has chronic partial sleep loss, ask them how they're doing and test them, there's a big mismatch. So that's certainly one of the things to be aware of as you go into this, one of the pitfalls. Again, just some other pictures. Oh yeah, oh, sorry, I was, this I can do this in my sleep. Yeah, that probably all of you have said that about things. And interestingly enough, there are some functions for which that's absolutely true. There's some great studies that were done with Army helicopter pilots, and they wanted to test them on doing emergency procedures, and they could not. 60 hours of complete sleep loss and the bold face on their checklist, they never made a mistake, right? But there are other functions which are greatly um, impaired by sleep loss, um, like, for example, vigilance, um, lapses in attention, and your ability to consider alternative explanations. When we're sleep deprived, we tend to tunnel in on one thing, along with many, many other, many, many other problems. So again, just some paragliding video or, sh or shots of when you probably would not want to be sleep deprived to get yourself out of a situation like this, right? You want to think on your, be able to think on your feet. So bad sleep. What about good sleep? What's good sleep like? Well, you know, certainly our mental performance and why this for us as pilots, we think about judgment and safety is spot on, right? We're in a better mood. Um, physical performance and recovery. And there is an abundant evidence that sleep is tied to physical performance. And certainly people who are training for a hike and fly race, obviously that's a really big deal, right? Um, overall health, right? There are countless uh, well-done studies linking good sleep to good health across the board. And of course, um, longevity and, um, and health span. So those of us in the sleep world, when we talk to people, we tend to get some fairly bipolar reactions, right? There are the people who just don't take it seriously at all. And maybe there are people who are high functioning compared to those around them. And they've been able to kind of play fast and loose with sleep, do things that probably you shouldn't do for your sleep. And they seem to be getting away with it. And for folks like that, I would say, number one, it's wonderful that you're that you've been safe and are functioning at a high level. Just look at some maybe low impact things you could do to tweak your sleep and do a little bit better. Um, and so not saying that you have to overturn your life, but just look at maybe a few little simple things you could do that might make a difference. On the other hand, we run into people when you bring this up, they're completely freaked out and stressed out about um, sleep issues, which is a self-defeating problem, right? Sleep is one of those sensitive things that if the more you're worried about it, the more you, you will um, get, <laughs> the more your sleep will suffer. So please do not um, fall into, into this category either, right? We're looking for, for more of a middle road. And, you know, I put this picture up, I took this a few months ago, because in some ways, to me, this exemplifies some of what I want to get to think about, you know, this is a picture of a well functioning team of people, you know, having fun paragliding, well, your, your body, right, if you're involved with hike and fly racing, you're obviously a high functioning individual, and your body is a collection of 
of functions that are doing well. And you see that one pilot at the bottom here, you know, as we all moved away from the hills out into the flats and you don't see a lot of clouds around us, right? We're in kind of a blue hole. There was some lift there, but no one knew where it was. And maybe the guy in the orange in the bottom went off on a worse direction, but we were a well-functioning team and, and he caught up with us and everything was good later in the day. Somebody else, may have gone off in the wrong direction and the guy in the orange, right? The point is our body is a very complex system with layers and layers and layers and checks and balances. And, um, you know, if one thing is off, there are things that we can do to make it better. So I, again, I want to remove this sense of catastrophe surrounding bad sleep. Look for opportunities to make it better, but don't think that a bad night of sleep or a couple of bad nights of sleep, you know, and, and, and you're guaranteed to crash or anything crazy like that. Um, so in a little bit of the physiology here, right, hopefully some, some of you folks may want to geek out on this kind of thing. And if you understand some of these basics, it will help you make decisions in your own life uh, about how to, you know, uh, no, no set of lectures or discussions or books or things that you read will can will prepare you for everything. But if you understand a few of the basics, you'll be able to make your own good decisions. So the the first thing that governs sleep, we call it process S. Homeostat is a fancy word for physiology. Basically, that means self stabilizing, right? And and it makes sense that if you are awake. The longer you're awake, the more you have a drive to sleep. If you're asleep, then that drive to stay asleep goes away, right? We, I think we all understand this intuitively. It turns out that this is tied to a, a chemical in your brain called adenosine, which is a normal element of metabolism. And the longer we're awake, the more that adenosine builds and the more pressure that takes driving us um, to sleep. Okay, there's also a circadian process, right? You guys hear about circadian biology. Um, there is another process that governs our rhythms in our body that run around 24 hours, right? Probably most people left to their own devices in a true free running environment would be a little bit off 24 hours, but around 24 hours. And it synchronizes all of your biological functions to each other. Think about a symphony, right? Okay, anyway, I was saying that there's this process W, right? All of us, I think, understand this, um, that if something really exciting is going on in your life, that will overdrive your need to sleep, and, and it can keep you, uh, keep you awake. So again, three major things that, that drive your sleep and everything we talked about will come back in some form or fashion to these three processes. Understanding them allows you to be your own sleep scientist. And as I go through this, some of my bullet points, I'll have a little icon of a scientist in its areas where I would suggest that maybe you can do some of your own work in your own life about, uh, about optimizing those factors. Okay, this is a picture of a typical night of sleep. You're, we use the term sleep stages. Here in this diagram, we're using the terms light sleep or deep sleep. And you cycle through sleep throughout the course of the night. Deep sleep, we drive that, that homeostatic process, that drive to sleep from being awake, the adenosine early in the night that drives us to have more of this. And you can see in this night of sleep, there was a lot more of the deep sleep. And then as that home, as you catch up and clear adenosine, then later in the night, you tend to have more of this in this purple color here is this REM sleep. And they both have different contributions to your normal, uh, to your normal function, right? So this is, when we talk about sleep, think about deep restorative sleep and uh, light sleep and REM sleep. And this is an example of a fairly typical night of cycling through um, sleep stages. So how much sleep do we need? Well, in general, we would typically say that a, um, typically say that seven to nine hours is a good amount of sleep to have, right? And most people can, um, can function on that. Um, but, you guys are not most people, right? You guys are athletes in training right now. And there have been several studies. And I've got a Stanford basketball player up here because 
one of these seminal studies was done in the Stanford basketball team, which showed that extending their sleep, you know, up to the nine to 10 hour range uh, created um, really clear reproducible improvements in their athletic function. And I guess I would say, and this, this has also been done in football players, right? It, where it's easy to me measure things like free throw performance and speed and reaction time. You know, nobody's doing these studies in paragliders. Um, it doesn't quite have the same cachet as the NFL, but, um, but the physiology is the physiology. And probably at a time that you're racing, maybe the time to think about extending your sleep if you can possibly do it. And again, strive for regularity. I will hit this over and over and over again. The more that your sleep is regular, the, we use the term entrainment, the more these circadian rhythms will run in synchrony with each other, the more you're going into a novel situation from a position of strength, right? not going into a novel situation from a position of, uh, of weakness, already behind on sleep, already with a dis disorganized chaotic rhythms. Now, I mentioned the term short sleepers here. One of the things that I hear from many people is, I don't need all that sleep. I'm fine without it. And in fact, there are such a thing. There are people who seem to have a reduced biological need for sleep. Um, there are far fewer of those people than those who believe they have a reduced biological need for sleep, right? When you put people in the lab who claim they're short sleepers, you find out that they're just used to being sleep deprived um, and, and they are significantly impaired by it and want to rebound their sleep. So if you think you're a short sleeper, you may be right, but probably not. You probably need the same amount of sleep that the, that the rest of us need. So for those of you who haven't been to uh, Monroe yet, this is an example of a beautiful morning in Monroe. You can see we often get a layer of clouds right below launch and a layer of golden aspen trees you know, below that. So it is an incredible place to be and to fly. Um, okay, so let's talk about napping, right? Napping is an important topic. Um, what's good about it? Well, it feels good. And remember that process S that I mentioned in the accumulation, this takes that adenosine down. And so we are more alert and we function better after an appropriate nap. The downside of it, unfortunately, it clears adenosine and it can rob sleep drive from your night's sleep. And so generally we would say avoid napping for probably seven or eight hours before your bedtime. Now, this is something that you may be able to experiment with on your own. And we'll talk at the end about how to conduct these self experiments, but um, generally it's a good idea to avoid that. And then it also is a good idea to keep your naps relatively short in duration. There's something called sleep inertia um, where um, if you get into deep sleep and you don't complete a full cycle through, you wake up, you're actually more impaired than if you had never napped. And by the way, in that, the, that sort of the, the slide, the pictures I showed at the beginning where I got myself into a bad mess in that 2,700 foot per minute circle, a, a thermal, another element of that was that I napped on launch and then woke up groggy. I didn't do a strategic nap. A strategic nap will be to limit that opportunity to 20 or 30 minutes. If you're really sleep deprived, maybe make that 15 or 20 minutes because you don't want to get into that deep sleep. If you do, then you should not be doing anything alertness critical probably for another hour or two. Okay, so napping short, we use the term strategic nap, short strategic naps can have a real boost. Here's a NASA study that looked at, and this should, those of us who fly in airliners, uh, warm our hearts. Um, these are events, the vertical axis here are sleep events in pilots at the controls of 747 airliners. And there is the no rest group and the rest group. So these pilots are flying over the Pacific Ocean and they were randomized to be allowed to take these short strategic nap opportunities while they were flying or not. And TOD is top of descent and then landing, right? We would consider that to be a critical phase of flight. And look at that. 
the people, the pilots that were randomized to not rest, look at the number of events they had to include micro sleeps during critical phase of flight here. If the pilots that took these short strategic naps had, had a very short number of uh, events when they were in cruise phase and no events crossing the Pacific Ocean. So one of many studies which show the benefits of strategic naps. Again, just don't do it too late in the day and don't do it for too long. Now, there are some napping alternatives out here. Some of you may be hearing these terms. Now, I'm not an expert in these things, but as they become more and more popular, I certainly have personally started to um, experiment with them, right? Yoga Nidra, also called yoga sleep, is something that you do while you are awake that has immediate neuropsychological benefits. And NSDR, or non-sleep deep rest, is another thing. Not only do they give you an immediate alerting effect, seemingly without causing that decrease in your sleep drive for later in the day, um, but they also can help train your brain to turn off more effectively when it's time to turn off. I put this alleyboothroyd.com because when I said Yoga Nidra on YouTube, that's the first one that came up. And I use her scripts primarily and they work for me. I don't, I'm not claiming that she's the best, just that's who came up first. So that's who I've been trying. There are lots of scripts available out there. Um, on websites and, um, and there are even apps now that do that. So something to think about as an alternative are, are these uh, yoga nidra and non-sleep deep rest. Again, 10 or 20 minutes. Again, here's another example where you definitely would not want your vigilance or your reaction time to be across two pilots. One of them, I'm ashamed to admit, was me, happened to find their way into a cloud and, and focused on a near collision, right? right? That would have been really, really bad if both of us hadn't done exactly the right thing, exactly the right time. We, were, we had a very high rate of speed coming towards one another. Um, so again, we all make mistakes sometimes. The mistakes are compounded if you're not ready to deal with it. Okay, caffeine, another important subject. So what does caffeine do to sleep? Um, well, I talked about the adenosine, right? That metabolite that builds up the longer you're awake and it has its effect by binding to what are called receptors, right? It's like a lock and key type mechanism. And when you take caffeine, that caffeine binds to those receptors um, and the adenosine can't. And so it's like winding back the clock on your sleep homeostat. It's like you are no longer that deep into your sleep debt. That's a wonderful thing. Um, there is such a thing as a caffeine crash, because of course, while you're on caffeine, the adenosine continues to build up. Now you don't feel it because the caffeine is blocking your adenosine receptors, but as your body clears it, not only do you go back to feeling the adenosine you had before the caffeine, now you have all the, all the additional caffeine. That can be a good thing around bedtime. It's probably not a good thing in the middle of um, when you're trying to perform. Um, so I would, don't, I would recommend not taking it for the first couple hours. You, oftentimes you'll wake up feeling a little bit groggy. You just want that first cup of coffee. There are a number, it's a long discussion, I won't go into it, a number of physiologic benefits to allowing your bodies, give yourself 10 minutes, the body's alerting mechanisms will take over. And if you can push starting that caffeine a couple hours into the day, it'll have, it'll have multiple benefits to include not needing it, um, uh, not needing as much of it. Um, and then probably avoid it for seven or eight hours before bed, bedtime. Now, I put the little scientist icon here though, because as opposed to the short sleeper, which is pretty darn rare, there is a significant variability in how we metabolize and respond to caffeine. And there are people who can pound, you know, double espressos at bedtime and it won't affect them. How do you know if you're one of those people in a systematic way, um, test yourself uh, on that. And then, you know, obviously there's an issue about the source of it, right? Like some of these plant-based sources have a number of other additional uh, beneficial substances. So I try to, I personally try to 
go more towards, you know, those items, but certainly energy drinks have a role and they are fast and they're a lot easier, more portable than brewing coffee, you know, when you're, um, when, you know, when you're out in the field, so to speak. So again, we've talked about this homeostat here and how it, how it increases your drive to sleep. You can imagine how chaotic life would be if all we did is respond to that homeostat. And I'm gonna, this is a, a figure that illustrates that. This is, this is, these are days on the rows, right? So day one through day 20. And this is through the time of day and the clusters of the black marks are behavior that that animal does when it's awake. And this is a normal animal. And you could see that there's areas of activity in areas of sleep and activity in sleep, right? And that extends itself. They did something to these animals to take away their pacemaker. I talked about the circadian process. They took it away and look at how chaotic it is. They're awake and building up adenosine, then they're asleep. And then burning off adenosine, then they're awake, right? We couldn't function in life if you were like that. So this process S does not go unopposed. The process C steps in and um, that's what I want to talk about next, right? So the you don't need to know this if you're a if you're a science geek and you want to. It's called the suprachiasmatic nucleus of the hypothalamus. That's the pacemaker of our brain, and chiasm refers to the it, the point where the nerves coming out of our eyes come back and then cross one another. And it's a very strategic location because the primary input into this thing, and it drives pretty much every cell in your body, follows a circadian rhythm. The pace setter for all of this is this nucleus. And what What's the pace setter for the nucleus? It's light and it's strategically located. So light coming in from your eyes goes straight back and straight up into that suprachiasmatic nucleus. I will say in case anyone has heard this, for years there have been people have theorized that we have photoreceptors someplace else in our body. Other animals do, humans do not. It's your eyes, period, dot. That's what drives our our circadian rhythms. And we do very well when we are synchronized to the world around us and when we are synchronized internally, right? Like that, it's like that symphony where the players choose when they want to come in and play their part and then go on a rest. If it's chaos, it sounds like chaos. Our physiology is like that as well. So again, that's why day-to-day -day, um, stability uh, matters. Um, I'm so committed to this that you can see I found myself in shadow on top of the agui and there was sunlight and I knew I needed sunlight for my circadian entrainment. So I got down there as fast as I could. So a little bit of a joke. So <laughs> this is again, flying in the sun in Chamonix. It's a beautiful place if you haven't been there. So how potent are these things to sport? Well, one of my favorite studies this is an old study, but I loved it. They looked at 25, NFL seasons, and they figured out, they compared East and West Coast teams, and overall, the West Coast teams for that 25 years that they looked at had a slight advantage, right? This is the percent of games won, but then they looked at Monday night football, which is held at nine o'clock Eastern Standard Time, and whether it's held on the East Coast or the West Coast, circadian biology would predict that the West Coast teams would have an advantage. And sure enough, compared to the Las Vegas point spread and compared to the historical win-loss record between those teams, they had a huge advantage on Monday night football. So that circadian biology effect in sport is not a, this is not a casual thing, right? Right. This is, think of how stable the stability that goes into training, preparing for an NFL game it is completely disrupted by, um, by a relatively modest, by a few hours in your circadian clock. So again, these processes interact. Um, if anybody is really wants to, um, wants to delve into it, this figure, I'm not going to explain it right now, it's from a beautiful lab from the chronobiology, a beautiful study from the chronobiology lab at Harvard, where they forced people out of synchrony, 
for a month to look at how it interacted. And you can imagine that as you're approaching bedtime, your drive to sleep is really, 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 really high. And so your function would be low, but we our function is not low. So there's a circadian process that drives it up. Anyone who is or has been the parent of a small child probably has seen this effect, right? You're getting ready for bed, you're kind of putting their toys away and quieting things down, and then suddenly it's like chaos. You turn around and they're going wild, toys are everywhere, and you're frustrated, and the next thing you know, they're asleep on the floor of the playroom, right? That's, that's that circadian drive to sleep is really strong. We have it as adults too. It's just, we don't run around and throw toys. Most of us don't run around and throw toys everywhere. The opposite would be, you know, now you've fallen asleep, you've burned all the beautiful deep sleep, burned through your adenosine, but it's not time to get up yet, right? That circadian process helps drive you to stay asleep. So these two things work with one another. And then by the way, siesta is an actual biologic drive. That idea of a short strategic nap in the afternoon, it helps our mood, it helps our performance. Um, again, maybe a reason to get into goal early in the race so you can hit your siesta before you pack up and get ready for the next day. Okay, so we talked about, next thing we got to talk about is light. Light is really, really important, right? That's the main pacemaker that drives our, um, that drives our rhythm. Um, and natural light is definitely more effective in impacting your rhythms. It's a lot brighter. There's a right mix of frequencies. But as you are absorbing this light, please listen to your eyes. If it hurts, don't look at it. Right. Like, you know, like in the morning, don't look at the sun, look at the uh, the horizon away from the sun. Um, and because you can damage your eyes by this. Um, a few simple points about light. There is something called a phase response curve. And this is really important for uh, for our for our rhythms. There's a there's something in in our physiology called the body temperature minimum. And this is a graph tracking your body temperature throughout the day. And about two hours before your natural awakening, your body temperature bottoms out. And when we when sleep people talk about body temperature minimum, I don't care what the temperature is. What we care about is the time of day. And that time of day is really important to your, to your um, sleep function. And this curve of what light does to your body changes at this body temperature minimum before. So let's say I normally wake up at 6.30 a.m. My body temperature minimum is going to be around 4.30 a.m. So go back to about 4 a.m. If you give me light at 4 a.m., it's like you put a screwdriver into my brain and change the setting on my clock to slow it down. So the clock on the wall says it's um, 4 o'clock a.m. The clock in my brain says, uh-uh, it's 2 a.m., right? And that really makes a difference when it's time to me to wake up and function, the fact that my clock has been slowed down. So light within a few hours before that body temperature minimum, so now I'm talking to you screen time, you know, hounds, that, that light tends to slow your clock down, hard to fall asleep, hard to wake up afterwards, right? So for me, now it's 5 a.m., um, you shine light into me, and that has a tendency to speed my clock uh, back up again. And that's really important for jet lag, it's for shift work, and it's really important for day-to-day -day life. So when I talk about understanding these basic processes and using them for your sleep, understand what light does to the, to the clock in your brain and how it depends uh, around that point. When I talk about keeping your bedroom really dark at night, you don't want to have light in here messing with your clock and slowing you down. When I talk about getting up and having light in the morning, that's what this is all about. So ideally, within the first couple of hours, you want to get a good dose of light. I can't quantify what that is because it depends on where you live and the angle of the sun and all kinds of things, but a good dose of light. 
And then in the early evening, it turns out that's probably another time to get a good healthy dose of light. But as you get close to bedtime, please do not do that. It, 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 it slows down the clock in your brain, messes up your circadian rhythms, and makes it hard to fall asleep. So here's some examples, right? This looks like a well-lit office. This is 120 lux. That's, you're not going to get a healthy boost in your, in your light at 120 lux. This is just outside in filtered sunlight. And look at this over here with sunlight filtered to the trees, 18,000 lux, right? Look at that. That just coming out and, you know, reading a paper, or if people even do that anymore, looking at your phone while you're sitting out here, it's going to have a really sharp effect on this, even in the shade, right? You look at this, and this is like a dense shadow with outdoor light. That's still 6,000 nearly 6,000 lux, much lighter than the indoor, uh, much brighter than the indoor light. So the point is in the morning, wake up, get outside and get, and get some light, depending upon where you live. If you're um, at a really Northern latitude on a cloudy day, that might need to be 40 minutes. If you're in, you know, close to the equator on a bright day, that could be 10 minutes. Okay. But light is an important anchor for you. Let me stop here and see, are there questions or comments that people have about anything that we've covered so far before we get into the next crop of things? We, am I, are you tracking me? Yes, yeah, great, man. That's awesome. Oh, good. Okay. Here's another Monroe picture, Cove, um, again, with the fall colors on there. Okay. Exercise, right? Well, we all know it's good for your health, your sleep, and obviously, uh, you know, you, you better be exercising before you come and start racing in, uh, in Monroe. Um, it turns out that it's also really good for your sleep. And this is kind of an interesting, a very well design, de designed recent study showed that a burst of hot 10 or 12 minutes of high intensity, like interval exercise, um, at any point during the day makes you much more likely to have good solid REM sleep at night. And so this is just what I do. I've got a really crazy life and I don't have time to exercise many days, but I can almost always throw in 12 minutes of high intensity intervals on the indoor bike or now I'm hitting the hills around my house. And that, and, and that, that is a simple thing that can help boost your um, boost your um, sleep quality and particularly your REM. Now, what's the right timing of exercise? There is, there are, you know, you could fill a train with the number of studies and opinions that go into this. And I have nothing to say about it, right? You've got Ben, who's an expert. You may have your own trainer. Maybe you're an expert. I'm not going to say anything about timing of exercise, except please do not do it for two to three hours before bedtime because it's very activating. It does make it, it does make it hard to sleep. So do exercise, you know, um, do some high intensity stuff. Even a few minutes can make a difference, but keep it away from that close to bedtime. What about alcohol? There is just so much that you could do with alcohol out there, right? So, so many creative things. Um, and, you know, I, do not actually mix absinthe, Jägermeister, and Pepto Bismol, but there are people who do that, by the way. <laughs> the internet is a crazy place, and you can find something uh, that somebody's willing to do. So, alcohol does make you sleepy. So, a lot of people think of alcohol as a sleep aid. However, multiple studies show that it disrupts um, that it disrupts the quality of your sleep in very real and reproducible um, ways. So, the optimal timing you know, probably six to eight hours. And this is database, right? There are studies that have looked at when you can drink alcohol. So if you think about living a normal life um, and when you go to bed, six to eight hours before, like you're probably at work. So if you're going to drink, right, are, are the sleep people saying that, you know, we need to bring back the two martini lunch? I don't know. I mean, these are the things that we have to wrestle with as individuals. I'm just giving you this science. The science says the, the closer you drink to bedtime, the more it's going to interrupt. So again, 
you know, to return it back to your enterprise, I would say this is a reason to be early into gold, right? Like if you get there, those gold beers at two o'clock in the afternoon, by bedtime, you will have metabolized the alcohol and cleared the metabolites, which are what interfere with your sleep well before bedtime, right? So we have to make our own decisions about this, but the science would say, you, you know, this is going to rob your sleep quality. And unfortunately, cannabis is the same way. So the first point I'll make about relative to this as a Utah, I should point out that while the rest of the country has embraced cannabis, Utah has not. <laughs> but if Gavin calls a really long cast, there are places nearby, you could fly potentially from Richfield, people have done it, to some place where you can relax with some cannabis. Um, it is not nearly as well studied as alcohol for obvious reasons. Um, we do know that it makes you feel sleepy and you're more likely to fall asleep. And unfortunately, um, we now know that, that in a manner similar to alcohol, it does interfere with the quality of your sleep. It's not nearly as well worked out the timing before sleep, okay? Um, so again, it's worth knowing if you use alcohol and cannabis that those are the things that are gonna erode from the quality of your sleep. Now, you know, a dose of realism here, and again, I'm giving you my, you know, I have to be careful The sleep society could, you know, revoke my membership for even saying this, but I recognize that you probably gotta be a little realistic. So understand what this is doing to you. And on what I would say is on any given night, way up against the other factors, right? Is there anything else going on in your life that's gonna affect your sleep? Are you looking at, having a short night of sleep, um, certainly bottle to throttle rules, and that's an FAA term, but you know, whatever, however it applies to your profession, any need to be particularly sharp, maybe those are nights that you're going to not have alcohol or keep the alcohol away because it'll erode your sleep or the, or the cannabis, but realistically, right, like, you know, um, you know, people are going to have alcohol and just understand that it is part of the picture and it's a tool in your kit to refine when you really need to refine it. And if I'm taking a softer position on alcohol and cannabis and sleep, it's because I'm saving my bullets for this next one, which is screen time. <laughs> screen time is a big problem around bedtime, right? Like it seems like suddenly you know, when it's time for bed, we need to see that Beverly Hillbillies reruns or whatever it is that you want to, whatever it is that you need to look at. Um, you know, you've been, you know, researching quilting and it's close to bedtime and you realize you never got around to seeing those landing videos, you know, those hike and fly race landing videos that you needed to see. Whatever it is, Screen time is a plague on our society from a sleep doctor's perspective, from many perspectives, but certainly I, I will only say it's a plague on our society around bedtime um, and when it draws us in. And so it is, if you go back to our process S, process C, process W, this is a three process loser for you, right? It distracts you from going to bed. So it shortens your sleep time. So you don't torch off as much of that adenosine. Um, the light resets your circadian clock and that interferes with good sleep. And it's activating, right? Like, you know, you're not watching stuff that if it, if it has you interested and engaged um, and you're watching it, then it's something that activates you and that interferes with sleep. So my advice is to keep screen time away from bedtime. How long? I don't know, probably a solid 30 minutes and definitely not while you're actually in bed. Um, uh, here's just another picture from Utah. You know, we're not just about Monroe. This is up in um, uh, uh, Crawford Mountain, which is another beautiful area in Utah to uh, fly. Um, okay, I got to talk about uh, melatonin because so many people think about melatonin in sleep. What I would say is I and many others in the sleep community want so badly for it all to be true and for melatonin to be as good as everyone seems to think it is. Unfortunately, it's not. 
what it does for you, and I'll mention this, I talked about what light does around your body temperature minimum, how it affects your, the clock in your brain. Melatonin does that in the opposite direction. So, so if you were to take a little dose of melatonin, remember that my body temperature minimum is at 430. If you wake me up at you know two and give me some melatonin, if you give me light, it's going to slow my clock down. If you give me melatonin, it's going to speed my clock up again. And much less so on the opposite side. Melatonin is a lot better on this side and doesn't seem to do as much on that side. So there is a physiologic effect to melatonin, right? And, and a basis for thinking it might do something. Unfortunately, melatonin is not just a sleep thing. It is a hormone that has effects all over your body and it affects important things in your body. Um, you know, if it biological calendar, look at animals with seasonal reproduction, all that's mediated through melatonin, even though humans by and large don't have seasonal reproduction, sex hormones, which affect everything in our physical and mental function, we call them sex hormones, but they affect everything are profoundly impacted by, by melatonin. And so I can't believe that the F that the FDA just says, oh, you know, like there's no other hormone that you can just run down to the local grocery store and buy doses of. And, and this is a particularly potent hormone. And please, please, please do not give melatonin to children. It definitely messes, uh, definitely messes with children. Um, it's been well studied and as a sleep aid, it flat out does not work. Again, well-designed placebo controlled trials, right? Where the, the person doing the sleep study and the person interpreting the sleep study have no idea what's in that pill they just took. You find out after the fact and the melatonin just flat out does not help as a sleep aid. The, another problem is that the doses you get are massively above the physiologic doses that your body provides. And so not only you're taking a hormone, you're overdosing on a hormone. And on top of that, because it's not regulated by the FDA, you have no idea how much is in that pill. And um, there was a recent study when they looked at like 27 different supplements and some of them were off by like thousands of percent in the quantity of melatonin that you're getting. Now it does work for jet lag and perhaps soon I'll have an opportunity to talk a little bit about jet lag. And I do have melatonin and I do use tiny doses of it for jet lag, but in general, I, and I think, I don't know of any, any sleep scientist or doctor that is out recommending melatonin. And if they are, I guess I'd like to, I'd question their judgment on that. Um, okay, changing, we talked about process C, pro process S, process W. An important part of setting the stage for sleep is dialing this down. Again, I am not an expert in these modalities, but there are a number of things that people have done with great benefit that help you dial that down, right? Meditation is focus-based and maybe takes your focus off scattered thoughts that are everywhere. We talked about the NSDR and Yoga Nidra. Worry time is the idea that, you know, close to bedtime, you get quiet and think about the things that are on your mind and write them down on a list. My mentor, Peter Howery, used to say, take an index card. On the front of the card, all the things you're worried about. I'm worried about this bill I've got to pay. I'm worried about whatever. And then take all those cards, flip them over, and say something I'm going to do tomorrow for that to fix that problem and put them away. That's something that helps dial that down. Again, you, this is a great chance for you to experiment in your own life and figures out, figure out what it is. Um, that you need to do. I would be a little worried that if you don't have to do at least a little something along these lines, right, one possible explanation would be that you're just like the completely most chill, balanced person, which if you are, that's wonderful. And I applaud. Another explanation may be that you're chronically sleep deprived and your, your other processes overdrive this. And we, we are wary of people who fall asleep too easily. So part of sleep is dialing down that process W. One of the techniques which is gaining in prominence is this idea of breath work. And here's a, here's a, a diagram from a very recent study, a 2023 study in a well-respected journal that looked at the physiologic effects of different 
patterns of breathing. And this idea of a physiologic side, these are ratios. This is not one second. It could be, if this is two seconds, that's a half a second. You breathe in, you take another small breath, and then you slowly breathe out, right? Box breathing, cyclical, they all have their own benefits for this, but these have a very potent effect on resetting your nervous system and can be used uh, you know, close to bedtime. Again, another great opportunity for you to, to study, you know, what helps you. So what is the ideal bedroom environment, right? Some of us may think the ideal bedroom is the one that you've just unpacked in the back of your paraglider harness, but wherever it is, a few of the bedroom rules we would use, right? Your bed should only be used for sleep and intimacy. If you're using it to watch TV, watch movies, stream the internet, catch up on work, then it already erodes. It's like you're taking away the foundation of good quality sleep. Keep that stuff out of the bedroom. It should be dark, as dark as you can make it. Light during, during the night has real health effects, blood pressure and you know things that you might not expect. On the range of what's comfortable for you, the cold end definitely helps you sleep better. One of the physiologic triggers to fall asleep is in fact, you can actually make somebody sleepy with, a, with an abrupt drop in their core body temperature. Melatonin, by the way, does that to you. On a schedule, you can enhance that by having it cold. And please do not have a visual reference to the time. Think about if, if you are awake and can see that clock, um, then um, it's like a finger pointing at you saying, you're an incompetent sleeper, you're no good, it's 3.20 and you're awake, now it's 4.15 and you're still awake. You do not need to see the time of night. Um, if, you, if you need an alarm, have an alarm, but don't have it visible. Seeing the clock at night is a terrible idea. Okay, so just another shot of winding down close to bedtime. So in terms of setting the stage for good night of sleep, our little bedtime routine of personal hygiene activities have an alerting effect. It's not a longstanding alerting effect, but probably the time to do it is not right before bed. Maybe back that up by 30 minutes or so. Turn off your devices. Again, remember I didn't make a big deal out of the alcohol and pot decisions. I do make a big deal out of the screen time. Now's the time to turn off your devices and put them away. Get the light level low. A lot has been made of blue light. And in fact, blue wavelengths are more effective at resetting your clock, but anything other than pure red light will do it. So just having a blue blocker is not gonna solve your problem. You gotta get the light level down low, especially blue. And a lot of devices now have a feature that takes the blue out around bedtime. That's a good thing. And then whatever it is, do something to begin winding your brain down. Um, we are in a new era with these wearable devices, right? I'm, you know, from an old school sleep perspective, we used to give people these sleep diaries, still do to as limited extent. And these things are very, very ineffective, right? The, the clerks in the sleep clinic know how effective they are because they're watching people fill out a two week sleep diary in the 10 minutes before they come in for their appointment, right? Sleep diaries are notoriously inaccurate. So we had something called Actigrips, right? And I hate to say that in, a, in my early career, we relied on these things. They're literally now museum pieces. This actograph was from like a NASA picture from a NASA museum. These have little accelerometers that measure your movement. Some of them even have light. And what's nice about that is the scientists who did the work with these things and compared them with electroencephalograms, you know, publish their peer review, publish their algorithm. So you really know what you were, what you were working with. And these were great tools. Insurance didn't pay for them, but in the military, we didn't have to worry about that. And we use accelerometers or actigraphs to great effect. Nowadays, they're everywhere. Probably most of us have one on their wrist right now. I do. I didn't get this to be an actigraph. I got it to be a GPS watch for you know, my outdoor sporting activities, but it turns out to be a really good actograph. Not only do they have accelerometers um, and light, but they also measure heart rate and breathing. One of the problems with this kind of, 
if if supplements are to prescribe medications, what um, what these modern wearables are to active graphs, right? All of this stuff is proprietary, so we don't have it's it's a it's a matter of faith whether you believe Fitbit or Garmin or whoever a Apple Watch whoever it is you don't really know what's going inside the black box because it hasn't been subjected to peer review um, and so you've got to, it's a matter of trust and does it seem to work in your life I will tell you as a long-standing sleep doctor the device that I use I have a great deal of faith in that and I think it's better than the activists that we used to have so again if you're a data geek this now becomes something that you can use to help refine your own sleep. And I'll give you some personal examples, right? When I trained in the military, when we were doing, you know, more active stuff in the field, we didn't bring sleeping bags. We couldn't. We had, to, we had too much other stuff to carry. We just slept in our clothes, right? We just get under a, under a tree and, you know, strap something over to keep the rain off. And so I, and I couldn't fit a sleeping bag in my harness. So I just started my Vol Viv journey without that. And here's an example in the fall and kind of a cool night um, of me sleeping out um, with clothes on, but no sleeping bag. And it just was a miserable night, right? You can see I'm awake, no REM sleep at all, a lot of wake time. And so last night, um, I literally, for the first time, brought a sleeping bag. Now, it was not easy to fit it into my harness, but look at this. Um, this now looks much closer to a normal light of sleep. You see, I fell asleep. I got deep sleep, maybe not as much as I normally would have. I woke up because there was a mosquito buzzing around, and I had to fuss around with how to close the the, the, the what'd you call it, the, the screen on my bivy sack. And then I woke up later because that made it hot. And so I had to say, okay, I'm going to deal with the mosquito. But you can see that this is much closer to a normal night of sleep. Now, again, this is not proved that sleeping bags are great. This is just an example of me using data because if you'd asked me, I would not been able to see the dramatic difference between those two. Here's another example. Sometimes we wake up feeling a little unrefreshed. One of the things that my watch does is called a body battery and it integrates a number of different functions of stress and rest. And you can see here during sleep, my body battery, this is in the early in the morning, got higher and higher and higher. I woke up not feeling that great, I did a little yoga nidra for 10 minutes and you could see my watch using whatever proprietary algorithm bumped it up. So we have tools on our wrists now, um, which are uh, allow you to take this to a new level if you have the interest. A few thoughts on doing it. Again, start from stability, right? Like you, 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 you're not gonna learn anything unless you're on a stable routine, as many things as possible, alcohol, caffeine, napping, wake time, get all that stable, then you can start changing one thing at a time and finding out if it makes a difference. And it should be reproducible. Again, one data point, I showed you one data point for sleep, that does not um, make a legitimate conclusion uh, you know, you should look and see if it happens. Now, I, I don't get the opportunity to do Volbiv enough that I'm going to have, you know, 30 nights with him without a sleeping bag. I'm just going to go off of that one data point. But you get, the, you get the picture here. And then when you find something that works, then that's part of your new stable routine. Then you can look at the next thing. So putting it all together, please get enough sleep, seven to nine hours, and think about around the time of an important athletic event, maybe even bumping that up higher, be as regular as possible. Your body can deal with that one Saturday night, Friday night, or whatever that you got to cut loose, but get back onto your regular schedule. Um, a good dose of light in the first couple of hours, and again, maybe later in the evening. Um, Figure out what things in your life um, make a difference to your sleep. Again, the things that we talked about, is ca the caffeine, the napping, the alcohol, the cannabis, and then approach those in a systematic way as you try to, try to do this. In the end, it can be a lot of fun actually taking control of something, you know, something fundamental like that. So um, the moon makes me think of sleep. So this is probably a good time to stop. So let me say, 
say, are there any questions or comments that uh, people have? And Gavin, I think you're on mute. I just was going to say, great talk. I learned a lot there. I actually thought about my my daughter because we've got one of these little uh, uh, little things that makes light at, at night. I'm going to turn it off from now on so she doesn't have that in her room anymore. But uh, thank you. I wanted to maybe offer some pragmatic or what I learned uh, in my races and just get your comments on that. See what you think about some of the things that I put into practice after working with a, a sleep doctor after the 2015 race going into the 2017 race. It's not, you know, the X Red Rocks is not totally demanding on sleep deprivation because it's three days, it's not 12. And, you know, we're, we're done at usually 8 PM and usually we're done around Monroe. So we, we get a, we get the chance of having pretty good, a pretty uh, full rest between each of the race days. But I, I think some of the things that I did learn would be really helpful for the participants. One was that when, when this, when this gentleman, you know, learned about the race and I, I talked him through kind of the, the, how, how it works for the 12 days, he, he had me pretty convinced that, or he said that studies have showed that you can bank sleep and so he was, he said, you know, as you get into your taper, the last couple of weeks before the actual race starts, and those of you who are training with Ben will have a bit of a taper through his training. So, he'll, you know, you, you ramp up, you ramp up, it gets harder and harder and harder until kind of the, the two weeks, uh, the, kind of the last month. And then the last two weeks, you'll start really tapering down and that'll give your body uh, a chance to fully recover and get completely charged up for the physical side. He said, in that time, what I really should try to do is get as much sleep as possible. And he said, you don't have to worry so much if you're not sleeping. He said, just even lying down, even, you know, even just resting and working on your, on your breathing and just closing your eyes, or like you said, doing a meditation. In other words, you know, he was saying, you're probably pretty you're probably pretty kind of full of adrenaline. You've got all the anxiousness of the race coming up. These are all just normal things. You can't make those go away necessarily. There's things that detune them, but but it's okay. It, don't, don't stress out about it. Don't stress out about even a bad night's sleep. Just rest a lot. Just, you know, just lie horizontal as much as you can. Uh, and that, I don't know, physiologically that had much of a difference, but it helped my head a lot. Just, just, you know, before the race, at the at the pre race week, you've got all this stuff you're running around a lot to do. But I made a real point of just going back to the van and lying down. Whenever I didn't have something I needed to do, I could just lie down and and kind of relax. And so, uh, I'll keep going, and then you can comment on some of these things. The other thought, the other the other thing he said was really important. And this wasn't just for me, but it was for the team. And we don't have supporters in the X Red Rocks, but it's good to think about. I, I think this falls into the C uh, category of what you were talking about in, in a sense, but when to use caffeine, when not to. You talked about how important it was to not use caffeine, you know, seven or eight hours before bed. But he he really stressed the 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 importance of when you first wake up, you're all kind of a gong, you're all out of it this is not the time to make a lot of really important decisions. You know, you want to make the decisions the night before, you know, when you're coming in, cause you're still, even though you've had a really long day, you're all fired up. You've had fun. Your brain is activated. You know, you're, you're, you're having some dinner. This is when you should be thinking about weather strategy, the task, all that stuff for the next day. Because when you wake up, especially after a short night's sleep, you're out of it. You're, you're not you're not able to process things very quick and like you said you know that especially if you can give yourself some time with the caffeine you know get walking get moving get outside get some light you know he he, he was definitely said it was very important to wait you know a, a couple hours even uh before making big decisions which in the exops was great because you're up at you're up at 4 30 you're moving by five so you're not making any decisions to seven and that always worked fine because you've always made, you already made those decisions the night before, you know, what you're doing the next morning, you're walking to this launch, you're going to take a sled ride. You've already got it all planned out. And then everybody's kind of 
they're with it. They've had some food, they've had their caffeine. So he was pretty big on, on, you know, caffeinating early, never caffeinating after two o'clock in the afternoon. Uh, so you can kind of set up for a good night's sleep. And then the other thing was that he talked about, you know, you obviously when you're, when you're not getting much sleep, you want to get as much as you can when you can, but the really important hours, I believe he said were kind of between one and four, it, kind of the middle of the night, or maybe it was 12 and three, I can't remember, but it was, there were, there was kind of a three hour window there. And this is again, specific to the X Alps, not so much the extra drugs, but it still does matter that, that those hours were really key, that that's when you definitely wanted to try to set yourself up for success and, and getting at least a few good hours of, because he totally agreed with you that there's no such thing as, or there is such thing, but most people need uh, an amount of sleep that you're just not going to get in the X Alps and can be hard in the X Red Rock. So that banking beforehand can really help. And then caffeine, ca using caffeine wisely and alcohol wisely, that smoked me in the 2019 race. Monster day. Uh, it was the day we climbed Titlis. And, you know, I had two back to back, one almost 5,000 meter day, and then over 5,000 meter day, two of them back to back and, and had a really beautiful flight off Titlis in a, in a ton of wind. It was quite scary takeoff, but had this gorgeous flight. And then we were camped next to this river and it was raining cats and dogs. I mean, it couldn't have been a better place to sleep. It was just, you know, you had the sound of the rain and you're by the river and it was beautiful, but I'd had such a monster day that with dinner, I had a gin and tonic and I thought it just, just felt good. It just felt nice to have and didn't sleep that night. And it was the only night of the race I didn't sleep. And the next day was just a total disaster. I couldn't, I couldn't put anything together. It was day eight of the race. I was in a great position. I was having a really good race. And that day was a nightmare. And I launched without a jacket. I didn't know where I was. I couldn't figure out anything Rev was telling me. And it was because I didn't sleep. And, and it was, and we, you know, so we banned alcohol from that moment on for all the rest of the races. We just said, no, nope, it's just not worth it. You know, it tastes good and it's, it's a nice thing to do, but uh, it's, it, it just doesn't work. It didn't work for me in that environment. Yep. It'll be there when you're done with the race. And like I said, my slide, when I talked about the sort of the realistic perspective on that, right? Like, um, when you've got something really going on, like I would say during the X uh, Red Rocks, or in your case, the X Alps, um, you know, maybe that's not the time to do it or timing wise, right? One of the things, you know, I myself, in addition to the sort of medical support, which unfortunately nobody has ever really needed anything and it will continue that way because it's smart pilots making good decisions. So one of the things that I've done is bring beers to gold, right? And that's at like two o'clock in the afternoon. I, from a sleep perspective, I think that's a fine thing. Have a couple of beers at goal, get in the van, come back, relax, and then, you know, prepare yourself for the next day. Um, but that's not going to hurt you. But yeah, the gin and tonic probably close to bedtime is going to interfere with your sleep at a critical time. In terms of banking sleep, whether you use the verbiage banking sleep or the probably better established concept of not showing up sleep deprived, the effect is the same. When you get close to an event like that, that's the time that you need to start building up your time. And don't worry, exactly as he said, if you're laying there in bed and you're awake, don't don't, you know, this is, this gets back to the bed as a battleground concept. Don't be angry and frustrated and get more and more tense and performance anxiety because you're not sleeping. Use that time to do quiet meditation. Some people are just good at this on their own. Um, and if you're not, there are a number of in my judgment, high quality tools that are out there. Again, the NSDR scripts, the Yoga Nidra scripts, the breathing exercises, things that you can do to help with that quiet wakefulness. And I've been experimenting with it again to the extent that the watch that I use is a Garmin, you know, Phoenix, and it's got this battery 
uh, you know, body battery thing in there. I got to tell you, and I've got more examples like this where I'll do that during the day. Like some days I'll, I'll take a nap. Some days I'll just do a non-sleep deep rest. According to Garmin, I get a bigger boost in my, um, in my quote, body battery from the non-sleep deep rest. And I'm not challenging my nighttime sleep and there's dopamine is this i don't want to get into there's a very very long complex discussion about dopamine right if if we're involved with this sport we're huge dopamine chasers it's not adrenaline people say you're adrenaline junkies we're dopamine junkies far more than adrenaline junkies um but the these other things seem to do more with that kind of thing so i i love the advice about um about banking sleep or at the very least clearing sleep deprivation before an event. I love the advice about um, not stressing. If you're not asleep, you'll get the physical rest. And, and now there are, again, what, if you're not good at it, there's a lot of help out there in terms of scripts that can help you make use of that. I love the idea of not making of decisions early in that morning time. I would further add, and I think there's, you'll find more and more people with this recommendation. Again, use that first couple of hours to maybe not out, again, use light, use physical activity and hygiene and your, all of those things will kind of bring you up. And then you can start bringing your caffeine in. And by the way, that'll also help you not bonk from your caffeine while you're trying to perform athletically um, and then clear it out. So yeah, no, I think all, I love all the advice that you got um, from that. And I think it does apply even to the X Red Rocks here. Great. Well, anybody else have any questions before we close this up, Bill? That was terrific. I learned a ton. Thank you for that. I appreciate it. Yeah, thanks, Bill. Yeah. Um, really appreciate the information. I, I have a quick question. Maybe it has an obvious answer, but that's about hydration before sleep. Uh, we're going to be training. We're going to be getting worked in the day. We're going to come back. We're going to be dehydrated. Should we is it okay, like a couple of glasses of water before bed, including obviously hydrating throughout in between the days? Do you have any sort of comments or guidance on that? Yeah, I've I haven't been able to track this down to primary data yet, but I somebody reputable has said that they it had been of that the question of how quickly because the problem with hydration before bed is of course it wakes you up to need to pee right. <laughs> Now, if you're a good sleeper, that's not a problem. Get up, pee, get right back to bed again, and you'll have a, a, an unimpaired night of sleep. So if you're a good sleeper and you can do that, then, then the hydration is really important. One of the things I've heard, and I've been meaning to try to track this back to the primary source, and I haven't tried yet, is drinking, doing your hydration a little bit more slowly, it impacts your kidney a little bit differently. And you may not have that same need to get up in the middle of the night. But yeah, I would not, I would not let the need to sleep overcome the need for hydration, um, especially if you're a good sleeper and are going to get yourself back to sleep again afterwards. And again, you get up, pee, get back in bed, you can't fall asleep again. Maybe now is the time to call on some of those other scripts that, that you can have on your phone. You can have it as an app, you know, the non-sleep deep rest, or, and then you will end up falling asleep by right? doing that, doing a breathing exercise. If your process C and your process S say, you should be sleeping and you've taken your process W out of it by doing breath work or something like that, you'll fall asleep. So thank you. Yes, do attend to your hydration um, and, and don't let that, uh, don't let sleep stop you from that. Ribs, we'll have a talk to just totally specific to hydrate hydration and nutrition as well. And you'll, you know, you can start experimenting this stuff with your own training, you know, before then, but we we learned a lot as a team and then ben's really good at that he's got a whole system down he's trained a lot of these you know the ultra athletes and stuff that you know people go pretty intensely for 24 hours or more kind of thing and and has has a pretty good system for that awesome yeah i'll look forward to it cool anybody else thank you the talk was great I enjoyed it. Yeah, that yeah, was awesome, Bill. You. Thanks, man. You're the bomb, dude. Love you. I appreciate it's it. A privilege. 
look forward to seeing folks in Monroe. Yeah. Yeah, man. Cool. Thanks, Thanks everybody. We'll have this up uh, up shortly to rewatch and we'll put it on YouTube as with the others, but thanks everybody. Appreciate it.